Professor Volta Ricciardi, who is the president of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and to talk about this very important issue from a European perspective. Uh, in Europe, we have uh, uh, quite different problems in the sense that uh, we don't have financial or organizational problems. Uh, and, but we have a commitment in general that every European government belonging to the European Union should improve the health of the population through vaccination to reduce the burden of infectious disease that can be prevented by a vaccine harmonize vaccine strategies, ensure equity and access to high quality vaccines and high level immunization services by reducing inequalities, to contrast inequalities by promoting vaccine interventions in marginalized or particularly vulnerable populations, and to ensure an active <coughs> and free offer of vaccination in the age groups and population risk, and particularly focus on for the elderly with the introduction of free of charge vaccination. And this has to be done at national level because even though there is the possibility for uh, European citizens uh, to move around uh, the 27 member states to seek for care, vaccination has to be delivered at national level. So this is the use of appropriate financial resources, uh, of of human resources, of logical resources. For instance, in Romania in 2015, there was a major outbreak of measles because of problem of procurement. Of, but most of all, it needs political willingness. And this in times is very seriously harmed by the incredible active uh, uh, propaganda that anti-vaccination is doing in Europe. This is a very uh, old struggle that started with the start of vaccines. So when Edward Jenner uh, discovered the vaccines uh, uh, in, uh, in the uh, late uh, 18th century, the reaction by the anti-vaxxers was already very evident is in this picture where they showed that people transformed into cows by the vaccines. And you can imagine a dying of the disease uh, uh, of where uh, Edward Jenner found uh, a, a vaccination. So you can understand that uh, uh, skepticism and resistance and, and what I, I would call today hesitancy is very old, but this can be very risky. And in fact, in many European states, and this is the case of Italy, has uh, led to a major dropping in vaccination. Traditionally in the past, herd immunity was easily reached for all uh, preventable uh, uh, diseases, uh, but uh, starting from 2014, when I took office as president of the Italian National Institute of Health, all uh, vaccines uh, uh, dropped below the, the safety line, and this was certainly an alarm. And in fact, the, the diseases were started to grow again. This is the uh, but uh, I can tell you later that measles was the most uh, important uh, outbreaks that we had in those years. Why is that? Because uh, vaccine hesitant individuals are, are a very heterogeneous people who hold varying uh, degrees of indecision about specific vaccines or vaccination in general, as Luis Eugenio and Razur already underlined. And vaccine hesitant individuals remain concerned about vaccines. Some may refuse or delay some of them, but accept others. Uh, some individuals may refuse all vaccines. Some of them can become really activists in fighting against. Why is that? There are different determinants. Uh, some are related to countries. Some are related to specific uh, characteristics of individuals or groups. Uh, some certain, certainly are related to vaccine or vaccination specific issues. And why is that? Because as uh, is very clearly explained in this book, which I strongly advise to read by Philip Roth, describing an outbreak of polio in the, in the United States uh, in the 50s, uh, when there was no vaccines and essentially the scare, the people just reacted with terror to an outbreak of polio. And of course, uh, they fear the consequences of having uh, problems like the one that have been uh, describing in the pictures. So we had that when we released the vaccine, long queue of people asking for a vaccine. And we had an incredible advocate in Elvis Presley that in one night uh, promoted on a TV show the provision of vaccines against polio. And the following day, the coverage was absolutely total 
So in, in only one night, 100% uh, of the population participated in the request of the polio. That was mainly due to fear. That was mainly due to terror. Now it's not uh, the way that it was, because in other words, vaccines are victims of their own success. So people are more scared of the side effects of vaccine rather than of disease that they have prevented. And this is incredibly fueled by the anti-vaccination claims that you can find in the, in the social media, where you can find that vaccine causes essentially everything, that they are simply the evil, that uh, of course they can produce a lot of problems, particularly to children. And they use incredibly strong visual communication such as these that of course scares mothers and parents while sometimes the reactions by the institution is very mild, is very scientific oriented, is very difficult to understand from these scared parents. And of course there is the, the propaganda about the fact that the people that promote vaccines are corrupt because they support Big Pharma. You know that this is not true. When you make any kind of cost effectiveness analysis, you find that the cost of the MMR, for instance, vaccination, is incredibly lower. It's not possible to compare the cost of an epidemic, of an outbreak, uh, to the cost of vaccination, which is one of the most effective, cost effective uh, treatment. But this is difficult to explain that, uh, of course, uh, uh, drug companies, which are not charity companies, of course, make a profit on vaccines, but this is not certainly the most important profit they make. And of course, uh, what you remember Elvis Presley uh, advocating for polio. We have indeed uh, celebrities that advocate against vaccines. You may recognize some of them, Hollywood stars such as Jim Carrey or Jenny McCarthy, and even the president of the United States campaigning for his election say that, you know, he wouldn't push for proper vaccination uh, and uh, allowing one-time massive shots that a small child cannot take, uh, making the parents again this fake news about autism and the relationship with the MMR. But what's the problem with us? What's the problem with science? What's the problem with public health professionals? Is that the tools that we use to counteract the anti-vaccine movement, of course, includes our, our traditional tools statistics, research, evidence-based information, and often we deliver them with complex charts, histograms, or statements uh, that are released in a very rigorous but very difficult to understand from lay people. And this approach uh, actually is not effective enough on its own to convince vaccine-hesitant parents that vaccines are safe, effective, and crucial to their children's health. And why is that? And why do we have to change? And we have to embrace a new way of communication with parents and in general, because vaccines are not now only dedicated to children, but also to elderly people and to other stories. Stories are the default mode of human thoughts. Uh, they are not numbers, not charts, not histograms. And storytelling is the most powerful tool. So utilizing some of the storytelling strategies using by the anti-vaccine movement in addition to evidence-based information could potentially offer providers, public health officials and pro-vaccine parents and opportunities to mount a much stronger defense against anti-vaccine messaging. Actually, it worked. But of course, it works if we rethink vaccine policy making in this area of vaccine hesitancy. So in other words, we have to give people information in a right place, we have to target appropriately who do we want to educate. So schools, universities are very good places where we can have these activities. We have to rethink our vaccine policies that the national, state and local immunization programs uh, uh, that implement can be less reactive. As Luis Eugenio said, not waiting for people in our office, but going there where people live and work. And of course, being proactive means new ways to identify mechanisms and opportunities to shape social norms regarding immunization attitudes and behaviors. And get back to the basis. To understand that parents who refuse vaccines overwhelmingly do so because they firmly believe they are doing what is best for their children. So we need policies and practices that are grounded in this perspective rather than focus on blaming parents and forcing parents to comply. 
Of course, it's not time to abandon current policies, but rather it's time to consider how we might redesign and rebuild vaccine policy and the policy making process to regain public confidence and sustain it in the future. Of course, this cannot be enough. Actually, in Italy, we started that, but when we had these massive outbreaks uh, together with Romania of uh, measles, uh, more than 5,000 cases uh, with a median age of 27 years old and the hospitalization rate of about 40%, we took actions. And of course, it was difficult, but we were able to pass a law in parliament introducing mandatory vaccination for uh, children for 12 uh, vaccinations. This was followed uh, in the following years by France and from some point of view uh, from Germany and even uh, the Netherlands and the United Kingdom that traditionally have used a much more voluntary based approach uh, are following this pathway. Sometimes you don't have to time to convince parents and you, you have time to of course pass a law even if this is difficult, if it, this can provoke reaction by the hesitant people, that at that time when we introduced the, the law was 30% of the population. They even went into the road to, to protest against the law. But I can tell you that after only one year, we not, not only we caught up in the coverage of bringing back the percentage of coverage to the herd immunity uh, threshold, but we reduced the vaccine hesitant population to no more than 3% because essentially we activated other ways of information of involving people. How do we do? Three examples. Uh, when a, a, a little girl died in Bologna because of pertussis, uh, the mother, rather than uh, only crying and despairing for the loss of, of her was recruited as one of the most important campaigner and advocate for vaccination. And she, she launched a, a petition on change.org that reached the support of tens of thousands of young mothers, only in one, 24 hours, 30,000 young mothers saying that they want to protect their children through vaccination. So this is very important because it's not from the public health authorities. This came from mothers, parents, families. We also have to be grateful to this guy. You don't know him, but this Italian scientist that has been celebrated by science as one that has become a celebrity by fighting vaccine skeptics with a very active campaign on social media and with a very aggressive kind of talk. So rather than trying to explain, he really uh, uh, made an aggressive irony and humor. Uh, this is uh, an example uh, blaming uh, parents, uh, not of course the ones that are scared for the health of their children, but one that are making active propaganda based on ignorance and on aggressive tools that I showed before. And this was extremely successful. Of course, he is a kind of love or hate him, but there are much more people that love him because he has something like one million followers on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, and of course, uh, this changed uh, the narrative of the of the of the story and of course we recruited other kinds of celebrity i can i'm sure you recognize the guy on the left you may not know the paralympics gold medalist on the right and she is a lady that was severely harmed by the fact that a doctor a doctor a pediatrician gave her false and wrong advice to the parents not to vaccinate again uh, meningitis, again meningococcus, and she very bravely showed the scarves of their suffering, encouraging uh, parents and uh, young kids uh, to be vaccinated uh, to avoid the suffering that uh, she said. And uh, we even recruited the Pope. Uh, this is the Pope vaccinating a child, and you can imagine that particularly in Catholic countries, this is very reassuring for a family looking to the Pope uh, giving something which some people think is the evil, uh, is not the evil, is protecting children. So in conclusion, overall, the design and delivery of intervention should try to reflect the following points. Target audiences should be clearly identified and specific issues were researched and understood. Intervention should focus on meaningful engagement, i.e. dialogue-based, social mobilization that supports realistic action Contestual influence from the individual to, to the health systems should be acknowledged and accounted for when choosing strategies. 
intervention should be multi-component and seek to address primary determinants of uptake across the different domains of influence and interventions must be evaluated even when there is this, this striking success as we had in some European countries. Evaluation is a very important tool to improve, improve, improve. Thank you very much for your attention.